Jim Messina on why he had to leave the band Poco. I'm John Bowden from Rock History Music. In some ways, at least in the beginning, Poco was a reaction to the band Buffalo Springfield ending. Both Jim Messina and Richie Fiore were part of Buffalo Springfield, along with Rusty Young, who was a guest on that very last Buffalo Springfield album. Of course, two of their bandmates, Neil Young and Stephen Stills, would go on to create Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. That last album by Buffalo Springfield was Last Time Around, released in the summer of 1968. Messina went on to produce two albums with Poco, their first two studio albums, and their first live project. In this clip, we talked to Jim Messina about the friction that grew in the band Poco, leaving him no choice but to leave the group, and spending some time with his replacement, Paul Cotton. Uh, leaving projects is, uh, you know, again, in 35 years of talking to people, there's all I, I hear a lot of regrets, and I mean, you know what hard times makes good people most people are satisfied with their choices but there's always a few times where we go uh, you know leaving poco um tell me about that well i got to the point where um i had produced two albums and for me in retrospect what i what i realized i was feeling didn't know it at the time i just felt it but richie was getting very frustrated personally with the fact he wasn't as successful as Steven or as successful as Neil. Uh, there was a lot of anxiety, a lot of nail biting. And didn't no matter what I did, didn't seem to be enough to help him. And you have to realize I came from being his producer. Yeah. I was the one that wrote his charts, made sure he had his musicians. Neil was always okay. And Stephen was fine. He'd get his own musicians and he'd call me up and say, okay, I want to do this. And I'd say, fine, I'd book the time, do it, get it recorded. He'd go off and start doing his overdose. But Richie was quite different. Richie didn't read music. Uh, he played acoustic guitar. Um, didn't know a lot of musicians. Uh, I'm the producer. So I hired them, filled out the contracts, wrote the charts, got them in. So now we're in Poco. And, and I think Richie's feeling like, well, this is my band. Um, right and that never really bothered me in terms of whether it was his band I mean it's his, it was his music we were doing so from that standpoint but it never really was his band we all owned it um, but he was getting a lot of to the point where he was getting a little angry and um, we had an incident that happened in the studio where he couldn't hit a note it was very frustrated very frustrated in those days you know, you see those little machines you got in the back. Well, we had this video machine they had turned into, I think it was a 16-track machine, and it had a button about the size that you see in a industrial area where if somebody gets acid in their face, you press this button and the water <laughs> shoots. That's the size of the record button on the machine. And it was totally union. So I was working in situations where the studio, very large room and console, and in another room, was the recordist who pressed the record button. And, and now I've got a guy out here trying to sing one note, one high note, and I have to grab that note. And I I was not allowed to touch the board even though I was an IEBW uh, union guy because they had these collective co-bargaining agreements that said an artist couldn't touch the board. Even though I was a union guy and it was my union, they wouldn't let me touch the board. So ordinarily, I would have gone, boom, we got the note. But here I am having to translate, you know, now, now, now for 13 or 14 times. And Richie thought he'd gotten the note. And the only way I could tell whether he'd have the note, I'd have to listen on input. I'd have to listen to what was going into the tape machine. But there was a gap of that much. Yeah. yeah. And that gap is a number of milliseconds. So I had to learn how to cue the guy in advance so that when he hit it, he was ahead of the cue. So this, I had gotten every note before that, but he, he thought he got the note. And I said, well, you know what? I think you may have got the note, but I don't think we got it. He said, what are you talking about? I said, well, so he came in and he pushes me out of the way. And he said, I guess I'm going to have to do things myself to get it right. It was at that moment I thought, I think you are. You know, it, maybe it's that time that you start doing things yourself. So I um, decided in my mind that I needed to leave. And uh, I still had an album to do. We had a live album to do. 
And so I, I let the guys know that I was going to be leaving and uh, had a conversation with uh, Clive Davis on a train to Philadelphia. And I explained to him I needed to leave. Um, but mainly I was just tired of being on the road, you know, uh, and uh, I had just gotten married. And uh, production was always something that I've done, having been an engineer and produced records even before Springfield. It, it was time for me to be home, be in L.A., and, and do what I felt I can do best. Um, so I made arrangements that uh, uh, I asked if if I um, complete this album, get somebody to replace me in Poco, uh, could I get the opportunity of, of perhaps getting an independent uh, production deal with CBS? And Clive said, you know, get this done, get the album done, make your transition happy, make sure that you don't hurt anybody and we'll work together and uh, I'll, I'll get you what you need. So I finished that record, uh, which was Deliverin', and uh, Paul Cotton, they chose to replace me. So I, Paul and I shared a room, and I taught him his parts that I played so that he'd be comfortable. What was, that, be what was that like? Was that, cool? was that cool with you? Are you one of those guys where you're going, well, it's the next step, I want to leave anyway. Was that okay? Um, it was okay because I, I wanted to leave, and, and again, my purpose was to leave this band in, in good shape, not not sabotage it. What, what would that do for me? You know, e even if I was successful and, and didn't know that would be happening afterwards, what am I gaining from that? Ah, those guys are a bunch of putzes. You know, I'm glad that they failed. No, that's not me. You know, being a producer, it's not about. Uh, I can't have that kind of ego. I, I, it has to be one for all and all for one if it's going to work. It has to be a whole a three musketeers if it doesn't work. So I, I was glad they found somebody to replace me. And I was more glad that he was a nice person because I had to share a room with him, right? But uh, we became good friends and I taught him his parts. And, uh, and we made the transition, I think it was uh, 1970. How do you remember this? Oh my God, you have an amazing brain. I don't know. I just do, you know. But um, he made the transition, and subsequent to which uh, Clive Davis honored his uh, his promise, and he negotiated a deal with my attorney, and I started working for CBS as an independent producer. And so it all worked out. You know, yeah. um, if you're not getting along with people, if I'm not getting along with people, I'd rather say, hey, look, let's let's make some different choices. We, we have different personalities here. We're all trying to do the best we can for but ourselves. Let Rachel. me ask, what, what, do you remember the song that you were trying to get that note on? Did no. It have, let's, leave, let's leave that whole I thing. mean, I don't, there, were, there were hundreds and hundreds of times where I had made punches for people. Yeah. But as I said, Richie was getting to the point where he was, he personally was getting very, very frustrated and was anxious about wanting the success. And I think it, uh, it's not something he did on purpose, but it was becoming apparent that it was getting harder and harder to work with him. And I, and I, what I didn't want to do is what happens sometimes, you turn around, take your fist and, you know, punch somebody in the eye. Uh, and what is that going to do? Yeah. You know, yeah. That's going to just ruin your, your re reputation. We'll have more of our conversation with Jim Messina. Go to jimmessina.com coming up next week. Make sure you comment on our videos, subscribe to our channel, and share our videos. I'm John Bowden. This is Rocky Street Music. Mm -hmm.